Hello, I'm Kevin with Gaming the Systems. Today I'm going to attempt to repair some of the things in this room. I have a large collection behind me and some of these systems are not working correctly. This is the second video that I've done on this. If you haven't seen that other one, I recommend you watch that one first because some of the material in it is going to carry into this one. Keep in mind that I'm learning how to do this stuff as you see me do it. So not only will it be a tutorial for you, it'll be a tutorial for me. And I will say, some things will go wrong in this video. I'm not a technical expert yet, but maybe I will be sometime. So let's head over to the first item that needs repaired. The first thing I'm going to do is work on the original Xbox. Now, I've had a lot of problems over the years with this unit, but there's one urgent matter I need to take care of. At least according to the internet, it's urgent. Perhaps you may have heard of the clock capacitor issue. For years I've been seeing these messages and I've had people directly tell me in the comments that I need to go inside my Xbox and remove that clock capacitor that causes issues. It's basically a capacitor full of acid and it will eventually leak and ruin the board. So I disconnected the Xbox and I'm looking at the back of it here. And according to the information I see, this particular Xbox will not have that issue because this is a revision 1.6. I'm not going to get into all the details, but there's a variety of ways that you can ascertain what revision it is. So in this one, I'm not going to go inside at all. There's other things wrong with this unit, but I need to learn some more stuff before I attempt it. But I have a small collection of spare systems in the house, and I happen to have two other original Xboxes. So I grabbed those, and the first one I looked at also has revision 1.6, so I'm not going inside that one either. But the third one was an earlier revision, so I will need to go inside that one. There's a lot of disconnecting I have to do to get down to the board where the capacitor is at. I noticed a lot of dust in there, so I'm blowing it out. There's a lot of capacitors in here and they all look alike, but I studied some things online and this is the one that I need to remove. I don't need to replace it, I just simply need to remove it. This will have the side effect of whenever I turn the console on, it will always ask me for the time and date. But this is my spare console anyway, and the board's gonna get ruined if I don't remove it. It has a set of short legs and I'm just trying to get underneath it to clip those legs. Sorry for blocking the view, it's just really hard to get to. I eventually got it out. He took it out. It looks like there's a little bit of residue underneath it, so I'm just going to clean it up. The next thing I'm going to work on is a PS1. I worked on this unit in the last video. In that one, the open button was sticking, causing me not to be able to shut the lid. So I cleaned out the mechanism around the open button. However, I overlooked something in that video. The button helps open the door, but the door itself has some gears on it. And it looks like those gears are dirty, and they may have contributed to the original issue with the door. I don't want to have to go through that again, so what I'm going to do is clean out those gears. From what I'm seeing here, they had some grease on them. I'm going to remove that grease, 
and put some new grease on it. Now I've seen some things on the internet saying you should never put any grease on gears. I don't know if the grease I see on it now was done at the factory or not, but if Sony chose to do it, I'm going to do it too. I'm using a toothbrush and a Q-tip to clean off the old grease. Using isopropyl alcohol, I had to clean some of the teeth on the gears and then move the gears forward a little bit and clean them some more. I'll be using white lithium grease and this is a highly recommended product when working on things like this. And I'm just going to put some of that onto the gears. Okay, that's one of the two things I want to do to the PS1. When I repaired the door in the last episode, I also went inside and just used the blower to blow the dust away from the inside because I was already in it. The thing is, the CD drive did not work as well after I did that repair, even though I barely touched the laser unit at all. It's just not loading very well on games. I was trying to play driver and it would freeze up during loading screens. Some other games didn't seem affected at all. I did read somewhere that if you turn your unit upside down and turn it on, then it'll work a lot better, but in my case it didn't work at all upside down. Eventually the lasers started making a weird noise that I'm pretty familiar with the noises that come from the PS1 and this was a new one. I didn't film any of that, that's why I'm describing it to you. So I'm going to try to service the laser and I'm going to see if lubricating it would help. There are some rust issues inside, but I've never had a problem with this unit until recently. I've been using it for years. This is one of the connectors to the laser assembly, and I'm just carefully taking it out. And there's also a ribbon cable that I have to disconnect. After that, the laser just comes right off. It was basically sitting on three pegs. And I've never serviced one of these before, and so I'm taking my time with it. There's some very small gears down here, and I'm cleaning those up. And I'm also working to clean up the rails that the sled slides down on. I'm going to use the lithium grease again. I'm going to put it on the gears and on the rails. I then reassembled the unit. There is no difference. I'm still having the issue. So I don't know what to do at this point. This is going to be a work in progress. I either have to mess around with the laser some more or order a replacement. So if I'm ever able to repair this, I'll be sure to make a video about it. Next up is the Astrocade. For those of you who aren't familiar with this, it came out in the 1970s. It was pretty much a competitor to the Atari 2600, but it didn't do as good. The unit works and I can play on it, but the picture quality is not that good. It's really fuzzy, kind of shadowy and stuff. It looks like something is in the need of repair. I noticed this years ago and I ordered a capacitor replacement kit for it thinking that would help. I let that kit sit around for a while, but I'm finally going to use it today. So I'm just going to take it apart and replace the capacitors. Taking this thing apart was definitely more challenging than any of the other ones I've taken apart before. There's a lot of different layers and a lot of different types of screws. And there's very little information online on how to take it apart and how to service it. I treaded really carefully and took my time so that I didn't break anything. The RF shielding is hard to get into, it's held on by screws, but also a bunch of little clips, which took forever to remove.
from what I understand is they basically took an arcade board and made a console out of it. So there's a lot of circuitry, it's very complex looking. And man, some of these capacitors are huge. Even at this point, I need to disassemble it more. There's an RF screen on the back of it, and that's screwed in by a lot of screws. The new capacitors I have to replace the old ones are radial, and many of the old ones are axial. Axial just means the legs go straight through it like an axis, and radial means there's two legs that go underneath it. So there's going to be a challenge in replacing one type with another, especially with these big ones. What I had to do is stretch the legs out and I connected one leg and then I had to use spare wiring to connect the other. Keep in mind this is my first time doing this so it looks very sloppy. But I continued on with the capacitor replacement. After I got past the big ones the rest of them were a little bit easier. Keep in mind that capacitors have a negative and a positive leg on them, at least most of them do. And I had to use a chart online to figure out which ones go where because the board was not clearly marked. There were some tight spaces but I eventually got them all in there. I reassembled everything and tested it, and when I turned it on there was a loud noise coming from the board, and then I noticed some smoke coming from it. Once I noticed the smoke I immediately turned it off. I didn't get that on video, but I can show you the aftermath. One of the resistors got overloaded and burned, and the resistor was toast. So I think I might have done something wrong, and I wasn't going to turn this thing back on until I repaired it further. I started looking over my work, and I discovered that I put in one of the capacitors backward, meaning I attached a negative to a positive and a positive to a negative. And that capacitor happened to be kind of close to the resistor, so that must have been the issue, but I wasn't 100% sure. Either way, the capacitor was okay. I removed it and set it aside. I then removed the resistor. I've never bought or replaced a resistor before, so this is my first time messing with them. I had to place an order for one with the exact same specifications. I had to go online and educate myself on how to find the proper replacement. The color rings that are on the resistor indicate the different specifications of that resistor, so I had to interpret those colors. The thing is, since it got burned, the colors were a little bit hard to see. But luckily I was recording a lot, and I had footage of what the resistor looked like before it became charred. It was hard to get a good view, but I think I was able to interpret the specifications of it, and I ordered a new one. When the new one came, I noticed it looked a lot smaller. For a little bit, I was thinking I had ordered the wrong one, but I'm pretty sure I got the specs right. I'm guessing that they can make the same type of resistor, just smaller now. So I went ahead and installed the new resistor right where the old one was, and it was kind of tricky to get down in there. And then I reinstalled the capacitor the correct way. Another thing I'm going to do while I have the Astrocade open is I'm going to install some heat sinks on a chip that's inside of it. Now this chip is prone to overheating according to everything I've read about it on the internet. Uh, a lot of people have installed things into their Astrocades to keep the temperature down for the overall unit but also for this particular chip. So I ordered some really small heat sinks off Amazon and I also bought some thermal glue to attach them to the top. Now when I first opened the Astrocade, there was some thermal paste that was on top of the chip, and the chip was flat up against the RF shielding, so the RF shielding was kind of used as a heat sink for it, but I've been told it's not very effective. Another thing I'm going to do to 
keep the unit cool is to not reinstall most of the RF shielding. It decreases airflow and the RF shielding from what I read isn't as necessary today as it was during the 70s and 80s. So I'm going to clean off that chip and apply the glue and the heat sinks and I'm just going to let it sit overnight and let it dry. I believe everything is on the line here. Here's the thing, if I ordered the wrong resistor, then I could potentially ruin this console. It all comes down to the color bands. Did I interpret the old one correctly, and did I order the correct new one? So I assembled the unit enough to turn it on, and I brought it back into the game room, and here's what happened. So now I'm going to turn the power switch on, and let's see if we hear any weird noises. There it is. Oh, well, I got some picture. And nothing is exploding. Maybe if I reinsert the game, let's turn it back off. I just cleaned the game before I put it in here, so it shouldn't be too dirty. Let's try again. Oh my Lord. You know what though, even without, with me replacing the capacitors, this doesn't look any better than it did before. I'm very happy that I can play it again, but overall the capacitor replacement seemed to have done nothing. I did learn a lot from the experience, so I wouldn't say I got nothing out of it, but it goes to show that a capacitor replacement is not a cure-all for everything. Believe it or not, I still have more things to repair, and I may show you that in a future video. That's all I had for this one though. May your games make you happy and smart, and may people respect you for playing them. So long everybody.